Hello, and welcome to Grand Dukes of the West, Episode 18, The Nicopolis Crusade, Part 3. We left off in September 1396, with the Crusaders finally coming within sight of Nicopolis. It's been a long journey, and the city on the Danube is the latest target of the Crusading army's ambitions. Chapter 5, Nicopolis The view of Nicopolis is striking, and the first object that fixes the attention is the outer wall, which climbs the steep almost perpendicularly and shows the protecting arms of the city with a boldness and hardihood which fully evince the importance attached to its possession by its founders and their successors. William Beatty, The Danube Nicopolis, modern Nicopol, held an important strategic position in the Danube River Valley. The town sits on the south bank of the river, near where two tributaries, the Osam and the Olt, join it. This confluence allows whoever controls Nicopolis to easily project power north into Wallachia and south into Bulgaria. Not only does its position give it the ability to be easily reinforced, but it also boasted strong natural and man-made defenses. The city sits on a plateau that meets the Danube on its northern end and tapers down into an open plain going south. Furthermore, the city had strong double walls surrounding it, and inside of those walls was a garrison much stronger and much better supplied both with food and weaponry than any that the Crusaders had run into thus far. The Turkish garrison was led by an experienced officer named Doan Bey. Doan was determined to protect Nicopolis and the Ottoman position at all costs, and was reported to have preferred martyrdom to surrender. He enforced strict discipline within the city and kept a vigilant watch on the actions of the Crusaders. Meanwhile, the Crusaders had approached the city and were preparing to invest Nicopolis. It was at Nicopolis that the Crusaders and Sigismund's portion of the Hungarian army met up with the rest of the Hungarian army, along with Voivod Mircea's Wallachian contingent and the combined Venetian, Genoese, and Knights Hospitaller fleet. And so the siege began. The Venetians cut off the city by river, while the Crusaders, Hungarians, and Wallachians began to surround it on land. One big oversight in the preparations was that neither the Crusaders nor the Hungarians had bothered to bring siege engines with them. This hadn't been an issue thus far in facing down the fortifications of Vidin and Oryahovo, but Nicopolis was another beast. The Burgundian French contingent set about building ladders to scale the walls, while the Hungarians and Wallachians began to dig tunnels under the walls in hopes of undermining them, but both ventures were for naught. The walls of Nicopolis were too strong, and the defenders of the city were on high alert. Upon their attempts to scale the walls, the crusaders were pelted by arrows and forced to fall back. So with their attempts to storm the city unsuccessful, the crusaders instead decided to starve the city. From here on out, discipline in the Crusader camp, never especially strong to begin with, fell apart. Rather than going out to scavenge for materials in order to construct more siege engines, the Crusaders sat around drinking and gambling. They did not even bother to maintain an active scouting force around the area, and they considered the fact that Bayezid had not sent an army against them thus far to mean that he was too scared of them to face the Crusade in open battle. Furthermore, Marshal Busico, not wanting anyone to ruin the party, decided to cut off the ears of any of the men who started to spread rumors of Bayezid's approach. But Bayezid the Thunderbolt was not cowering in fear in his capital of Adirna. Instead, his attentions were focused on Constantinople. The Byzantine capital was currently also besieged, but when the Sultan heard that a crusader army was ravaging his northern border and currently besieging the key to that border, he knew he had to respond in force. Bayezid burnt the siege engines that he had been constructing and raced north with his army. Once at Adirna, he summoned additional soldiers and then made his way quickly to Nicopolis, picking up an additional Serbian force led by Stefan Lazarevic along the way. The reason that the Crusaders had thus far not faced a formidable Ottoman army was that Bayezid had sent orders to his commanders not to engage but to assemble at either Adirna or Plovdiv. The Ottoman army reached the plain south of Nicopolis on the 24th of September and set up their camp, the speed of their arrival giving further justification to Bayezid's sobriquet of the Thunderbolt. 
Ottoman chroniclers relate a story from that night, where Bayezid snuck up to the walls of the city in Hungarian garb, where he was able to speak with Doan Bey. Quote, Hang on bravely, I will look after you, he told his commander. You shall see that I will be here like a flash of lightning. The first clash of arms between the Crusaders and the Ottomans at Nicopolis came earlier on the day of the 24th. As the Ottomans were approaching, Angaran de Cusi, one of the few crusaders interested in scouting, was surveying the area with a small force of troops and found a company of Ottoman soldiers. De Cusi ordered most of his men to hide in the woods while he led a small force to attack the company and then feign a retreat. The Ottomans chased de Cusi into the woods where the rest of his men were hiding and were in turn ambushed and slaughtered. Upon de Cusi's return to the crusader camp, it became clear that an Ottoman army was nearby. De Cusi's raid also further contributed to the Crusaders' overconfidence and shed a light on some tensions within the Crusading camp. These tensions were on full display the next morning, when a war council was called. Here Sigismund proposed that the battle be led by the Hungarian, Wallachian, and Transylvanian force, with the Crusaders in the rear. Sigismund had good reasons to put this plan forward. First, the Crusaders had never fought a true Ottoman army, while the Hungarians, Wallachians, and Transylvanians all had years of experience to draw from. Furthermore, Sigismund knew that he could not totally rely on the loyalty of the Wallachian and Transylvania voivodes, and that, if given the opportunity, there was a good chance that they would desert. If the Wallachian and Transylvanian forces were in the vanguard, they would not get an opportunity to desert. Sigismund also knew that the Ottoman Sultan would keep a reserve force of some of his best men for a final assault, and hoped to do the same with the Crusaders. These justifications made sense to many of the older Crusaders, such as de Cusi and the Admiral of France, Jean de Vienne. However, amongst the younger cohort, especially Marshal Boussicot and Philip of Artois, Count of Eu and Constable of France, there was a demand to be placed in the vanguard. The Count of Eu, as Constable of France, had the right to occupy the vanguard of any army he fought with, and argued that despite being nowhere near France, he maintained that right. Boussicot, meanwhile, lambasted de Cusy for not letting John of Nevers lead the earlier raid, and argued that since he had already had his moment of glory, he was fine not letting the rest of the Crusaders earn any. John was still a fairly untested youth, and besides being present at the battles, or if you prefer massacres, of Vidin and Oryehovo, still hadn't had the chance to really distinguish himself in battle. He ended up siding with the younger crusading cohort, and, thinking back to his father's instructions before he left Burgundy, demanded a spot in the front. So with the Ottoman force now approaching, preparations for the battle began. The Crusaders took the opportunity to kill any of the prisoners that they had taken during the campaign thus far, so they wouldn't have to deal with a potentially unfriendly group in their own camp. Before we recount the battle, I'd like to mention that many of the details of this battle, and in fact many of the details of the Crusade, from the sizes of the armies to the routes taken by those armies, vary from source to source and chronicle to chronicle. I'm presenting the version of the battle that most of my sources agree on, but there are alternative tellings of the battle, and no definitive account exists. Speaking of army sizes, this is possibly the most disputed part of Nicopolis. Modern estimates of both sides place the armies at somewhere between 15 and 25,000 strong each, while my sources tend to lean towards the smaller numbers. Anyways, after some light massacring that won't in any way backfire later, the Crusaders lined up on the field south of Nicopolis. Sigismund's Hungarian force lined up behind the Crusaders, with the Transylvanian contingent on Sigismund's right and the Wallachian contingent on his left. On the other side of the field, on a hill facing Nicopolis, was the Ottoman army. The Ottoman front line was made up of light cavalry. Behind the cavalry was the main Ottoman infantry force, made up in part by the Janissaries and archers, and guarded by a line of sharpened stakes which were dug into the ground, pointing forward to prevent the crusading cavalry from charging at them. On either flank of the infantry was a unit of Sipahi cavalry, and waiting in the back of the Ottoman position, hidden by the slope of the hill, was Bayezid with his personal guard units and Stefan Lazarevich with his Serbian force. With a cry of, Vive Saint Denis! The Crusaders charged at the Ottomans. The light cavalry broke quickly, and soon the Crusaders were dealing with stakes and arrows. Some of the Crusaders were unhorsed by the stakes, and some of their horses were said to have fled in a stampede towards the Hungarian lines. At this point, the Crusaders formed up into lines of mixed infantry and cavalry to advance on the Ottoman infantry. 
Their march was uphill in heavy armor, so by the time that the crusaders reached the Ottoman infantry, those on horse had lost much of their momentum, and those on foot were quite tired. But once face to face with the Ottomans, the crusaders had the advantage. The unhorsed crusaders began to remove the stakes from the ground and create a path for their horsed comrades. Once they were able to get through, things began to look up. Much of the Ottoman army were lightly armored or unarmored archers. They could deal a tremendous amount of damage from a distance, but couldn't do as much at close range. Many had a short sword, mace, or dagger on them as well, but that was of little use against the knights. Meanwhile, the crusaders were heavily armored and wielded sharp melee weapons. So after driving off the Ottoman light cavalry, the crusaders made quick work of the Ottoman infantry, and the survivors fled downhill into their flanks to seek protection with the Sipahis. At this point, the more experienced men, specifically De Vienne and De Cousy, called for a break, to rest, regroup, and wait for the Hungarian army to catch up. But the younger men had their blood boiling and wanted to fight on. The crusaders continued up the hill, and upon reaching the summit, heard a cry of, Allahu Akbar! Bayezid had ordered the Sipahi on the wings, as well as his own forces, to advance on the crusaders, and all of a sudden, the crusaders were surrounded on the top of the hill. A great slaughter now ensued, as many of the crusaders were killed, while the rest, including the Count of Nevers, were captured. But the defeat of the crusaders did not mean that the battle was over. We still have to deal with the Hungarians, Transylvanians, and Wallachians. As the crusaders had advanced quickly and without giving the Hungarians a heads up, by the time the Ottomans surrounded the crusaders, the Hungarian army was too far back to give immediate help. While the crusaders were being surrounded, Sigismund moved his troops in to relieve them. As the Hungarian army advanced, they were able to quickly break through a line of Ottoman infantry that had reformed from the forces broken by the crusaders earlier in the battle. But after that initial victory, Stefan Lazarevich rode in from behind the hill with his fresh Serbian cavalry and charged at the Hungarians. Seeing this, the Transylvanian and Wallachian contingents fled the field, hoping to preserve their armies for the defense of their own territories. But the battle was not yet lost. The Serbian and Hungarian forces fought bitterly before Lazarevich's men began to get the upper hand. Finally, as the tide began to turn decisively against the Hungarians, Sigismund was convinced to flee the field. He managed to flee to the Danube, where he boarded a barge and was eventually rescued by a Venetian galley and taken first to Constantinople before returning to Hungary. Quote, We lost the battle by the pride and vanity of those French. If they had believed my advice, we had enough men to fight our enemies. Sigismund was reported to have said in the battle's aftermath. Many more Hungarian soldiers attempted to flee, few with much success. Many were shot with arrows or cut down by Sipahis. Others made it all the way to the river, but drowned trying to cross into Wallachian territory, weighed down by their armor and the day's fight. Some did make it out of the battle alive, but were forced to face a hard journey home. And of course, many of the Hungarians and Crusaders were captured during the battle. An estimated two to 3,000 prisoners were taken back to the Ottoman camp. In the aftermath of the battle, Bayezid found the remains of the prisoners from Vidin and Oryehovo, and hearing of the massacres that the Crusaders had carried out throughout their campaign, combined with the heavy losses inflicted on the Ottoman army, the Sultan decided to repay blood with blood. Jacques Dei, a captured crusader who had served as a mercenary for Murad earlier in his life, was recognized by the Ottomans, and he was made to select the most senior captives who could be ransomed, while the rest were condemned to die. Bayezid reportedly made John watch the executions with him, and it was because of this that the Count of Nevers was able to save Boussicot's life. The marshal was slated to be executed, but upon seeing him, John fell to his knees and begged for the marshal's life. But while Busico was saved, many more men died that day. The sources I have disagree on whether or not all of the prisoners were actually executed, or if the threat of mass execution was made and then lifted after a suitable number of heads rolled. But either way, the survivors were sent to Adirna and then to Bursa. The Ottoman army remained by Nicopolis and began raiding the surrounding territories. After some time devastating the Danube region, Bayezid decided to return south to his empire's core territories. While Hungary had just lost its army and Sigismund was currently nowhere to be found, the Ottomans had also suffered heavy losses and there was still consolidation to be done in the southern Balkans as well as in Anatolia. As Bayezid left the field, he did so in triumph, and while much of the credit does have to go to Ottoman tactics and their military configuration, 
The real difference between victory and defeat lay in the fact that the Ottomans were able to use their resources throughout the battle in a sustained push and managed to find and exploit their enemy's poor positioning, while the Crusaders charged only thinking of glory, and despite their initial success, found themselves out of position and exposed. And so this expedition came to be known as the Nicopolis Crusade, rather than the Tenth Crusade, the Great Crusade, or something equally impressive. Nicopolis, rather than Adirna, or Constantinople, or Alexandria, or Jerusalem, was the terminus of the Crusaders. John is said to have fought well during the battle, and for his conduct at Nicopolis earned the sobriquet sans peur, or the fearless. It is interesting to notice the similarities in how John and his father Philip the Bold earned their titles. Both fought bravely, even as the battle turned hopeless, and both were captured in battle. If Philip was worried for his son's well-being, he could at least take comfort in the fact that John had fought well and followed his lead. Chapter 6. The Return Home There is nothing that cannot be fixed with gold and money. Dino Rapondi, spoken during negotiations over the ransom of the Crusaders. It wasn't until early December that word of the disaster of Nicopolis reached France. By then, some of the crusaders that had managed to escape had made their way home, but they were not welcomed back with open arms. They brought news of a disaster that, quite frankly, no one wanted to believe. It was inconceivable to many lords of France that the great flower of Western chivalry could be destroyed by a group of, in their minds, barbarians. These stragglers were seized and imprisoned and threatened with drowning once the rumors that they spread were proven false, but nevertheless, there was great anxiety amongst the courts of France. But the fears of the French were confirmed when Jacques Dailly returned to Paris on Christmas Day 1396 and made his way to the Hotel Saint-Paul bearing letters written by the captured crusaders and a request from Bayezid to begin negotiating a ransom. Jacques Dailly was a trusted member of Philip's Burgundian administration and brought with him proof of the stories he told, so he was not imprisoned but instead rewarded by the king for bearing the messages. Almost immediately after recounting his tale to the king, Dei was accosted by the nobles with friends and relatives amongst the crusaders. The scene at court was a chaotic mixture of joy and sorrow, as some took comfort in the knowledge that their loved ones were alive while others mourned their deaths. Meanwhile, the first crusaders to return and spread the word of their defeat were quietly released from prison. While Philip was no doubt relieved by the news that his son was alive, he had lost valuable officers and close friends at Nicopolis, such as Guillaume de la Tremoille, Jean de Vienne, Philippe de Bar, and Oudard de Chasseron. The Dampier House of Flanders was pared back as Margaret of Burgundy had lost three of her half-brothers. So although Philip's dynasty was assured, he was not above shedding tears for the fallen. However, Dei was not a free man. He had been paroled by Bayezid to open negotiations, but was expected back in Ottoman territory. So Dei began the journey back east, accompanied by three more members of Philip the Bold's administration. The Burgundian delegation brought with them fine gifts in hope of buttering up the sultan, including, but not limited to, chargers, falcons, hounds, a tapestry depicting the life of Alexander the Great, fine cloth, and jewels. The gifts had the intended effect, and Bayezid began his negotiations in a good mood. However, they also put Bayezid under the impression that a lord wealthy enough to give such fine gifts should also be able to afford an exorbitant ransom. So after some negotiation, in mid-1397, the ransom was set at about 200,000 ducats, a huge sum that roughly translates to somewhere between 210 and 220,000 francs, about half the cost of the preparations for the crusade. But now that a sum was agreed to, it had to be paid. Here the captives benefited from the political situation in Italy. After being threatened with annexation by Milan, the Republic of Genoa placed itself under the protection of the French king in late 1396. The king made his acceptance of this role contingent upon the Genoese aiding in negotiations with Bayezid and assisting in paying the ransom. While the French were confidently ordering the Genoese to help pay the ransom, they were also meekly asking the Venetians. The sum demanded was too big for the French to pay alone, and even with Genoese help, it was still a massive sum, and the only European power that could comfortably pay it up front was Venice. While the French had geopolitical leverage over Genoa, they did not have it over the other great Italian merchant republic, and so a stream of letters from the great lords of France reached the desk of the Doge of Venice asking for aid. 
After nine months in captivity, John the Fearless was able to borrow some money from the Genoese merchants in the eastern Mediterranean and from a nephew of the King of Cyprus, and paid Bayezid 28,000 ducats. The rest of the sum was either paid by merchants in Ottoman territory or promised within a month and guaranteed by a handful of Venetian and Genoese merchants. With the down payment and guarantees, the crusaders were free to return home. But before they did, Bayezid summoned them to him and, according to Foissart, gave the following speech, quote, John, I am well informed that in your country you are a great lord and son to a powerful prince. You are now departing and can look forward to many years, and, as you might be blamed for the ill success of your first attempt in arms, you might desire to wipe out this blot and regain your honor and summon a powerful army to lead against me and offer battle. If I feared you, I would make you and your companions swear on your faith and honor that neither you nor they would ever bear arms against me. But no, I will not demand such an oath. On the contrary, I shall be glad that if, when you return to your country, it pleases you to assemble an army and lead it here, you will always find me prepared and ready to meet you on the field of battle. What I now say, repeat to whomever you wish, for I am ready for and desirous of deeds of arms and of extending my conquests. And with that, the Crusaders left the Ottoman Empire, and Busico would be the only one of these Crusaders to take Bayezid up on his offer. The Crusaders left Bursa and sailed first to the island of Lesbos. After staying at Lesbos for a month or so, the Crusaders made their way to Rhodes to visit with the Knights of St. John and borrow some more money so the rest of their journey would be comfortable. After departing Rhodes, the Crusaders island hopped up the Aegean, Ionian, and Adriatic seas before finally reaching Venice in October. Once in Venice, the Crusaders were made to remain in the city until the portions of the ransom forwarded by the Venetian merchants was repaid. However, upon an outbreak of plague reaching Venice, the Crusaders demanded to be able to return home. Dino Rapondi, a Lucchese merchant in the employ of Philip the Bold, was able to personally guarantee repayment, and so the Venetians allowed the Crusaders to continue their journey home. But by the time that the Crusaders began their journey from Venetian territory back to France, four of the captured Crusaders had succumbed to illness or injury. Guy de la Tremoille, Angeron de Cousy, Philip of Artois, Comte of Eu, and Henri de Bar. Despite being away from home for so long, the Crusaders were not in a terrible hurry to return. Their march was leisurely, and they took short breaks from traveling quite often, and it was not until late February 1398 that the Crusaders returned to Dijon. Before we get into the reception that the Crusaders received in France, I want to explore the payment of the ransom a bit more. At this point, in addition to the 200,000 ducat ransom, John and his companions had incurred 100,000 ducats worth of expenses on their journey back. We can also add the value of the gifts that Philip sent Bayezid to come to a total ransom and return cost of around 400,000 ducats. By the time that the Crusaders had left Ottoman territory, 75,000 ducats had been paid to the Sultan, with the rest promised by Venetian and Genoese merchants, with additional help coming from the King of Cyprus and the Knights of St. John. Therefore, when Philip himself began to make ransom payments, he had to make these payments primarily to Italian merchants. Sigismund had offered to pay half the ransom, but couldn't afford it, so Dino Rapondi made the payment for him in exchange for Sigismund transferring a tribute payment from Venice for 7,000 ducats a year to Rapondi. However, Venice refused to pay the sum to Rapondi, so Philip bought it out from his favorite banker. The issue of lack of payment from Venice wouldn't be resolved until the reign of Philip the Good. Meanwhile, back in Burgundy, Philip the Bold was in the process of levying a huge amount of taxes. In 1397, Philip more than doubled his usual aid request to his territories, and while he did not get everything he asked for, he was able to raise a significant amount of money and guarantee some additional payments over the next few years. But he could only raise so much from his territories, especially when they had already paid much more than usual two years earlier to fund the crusade in the first place. Philip was further able to draw on some royal funds to help him pay off the ransom and furthermore reduce the salaries of many of his officers over the next few years. Between squeezing his subjects and raiding the French treasury, Philip seems to have been able to pay off the crusader ransom without too much trouble. And in fact, while many of his officers had their salaries cut, Philip appears to have done little to reduce the cost of his own household in the years after Nicopolis. That being said, Philip does seem to have taken his time with repayment to the Italian creditors. We don't have much of a reason to believe that Philip died in debt to them, but we do see messages from Italian merchants to Philip demanding repayment dating to 1400, 1401, and 1403. 
So with the financial situation dealt with, we can finally greet John the Fearless and his comrades-in-arms back in Dijon. The Burgundian prince had returned home on February 22, 1398, almost 22 months after he left. In Dijon, John finally met his one-and-a-half-year-old son Philip, future Duke Philip the Good, who was born while John was still heading east towards Nicopolis. As John entered Dijon, he was greeted not as a defeated soldier but as a conquering hero. Despite the Battle of Nicopolis ending up as a disaster for the Crusaders, John, and by extension Burgundy, gained a ton of prestige as the leader of the Crusade. Furthermore, his captivity in Ottoman hands was likened to a kind of martyrdom. While the initial news of the defeat at Nicopolis had been greeted by mourning and despair, by the time that John returned to France, that mood had dissipated and was replaced with one of jubilation. From Dijon, John made his way up to Paris where he was received by the king and from there made his way to Ghent to meet up with his father. The duke and his heir then embarked on a tour of the towns of Artois, Flanders, and Brabant. Everywhere John went, he was received with praise and celebration. Quoting Bart von Loh, quote, Philip the Bold did all he could to make his investment in the crusade pay off. By constantly banging on about his son's heroic deeds and by peddling him as a chivalric trophy, Philip succeeded in suppressing thoughts of the defeat. In the wake of John's return to France, Philip founded an order of chivalry, the Order of the Golden Tree, to promote both John's accomplishments, whatever they were, and the House of Valois Burgundy more generally. While today this order is overshadowed by Philip the Good's Order of the Golden Fleece, at the time it was yet another order of chivalry founded by a powerful prince. Sigismund would found his own order a few years later, the Order of the Dragon. I know I'm about to go on a tangent of a tangent, but one of the members of Sigismund's Order of the Dragon was Vlad, a later voivode of Wallachia. Vlad was known as Vlad Dracul, or Vlad the Dragon, because of his membership in the order, and so his son, Vlad the Impaler, was thus known as Dracula, or Son of the Dragon. And so the legacy of Nicopolis, rather than being one of military brilliance, the return of the Crusader states, or even more modestly the strengthening of the Christian position in the Balkans, was one of a confusing glory. In the end, it proved to be a crusade for its own sake. The Crusaders routinely ignored the advice of more experienced locals and were overconfident to the point of delusion. In the end, their overconfidence and haughtiness was their undoing, and almost all of them met their end from an Ottoman arrow, spear, or sword. And yet, none of that seemed to matter back home. If Nicopolis was a crusade for its own sake, then it had succeeded. The crusaders went on a crusade. Despite the mass casualties, glory had been earned. The main benefit of the crusade was not geopolitical, and the main beneficiary, rather than Sigismund and Hungary, was Philip the Bold and Burgundy. And so let's end with a quote from Richard Vaughn, quote, Thus ended the disaster of Nicopolis, in a blaze of glory which somehow conjured up triumph out of defeat and tragedy. The fame and prestige of the House of Burgundy had been successfully promoted, and it was now linked forever with the proud and almost magic tradition of the Crusades. Epilogue As we started this series by reviewing Hungarian and Ottoman history in the 1300s, I think it's fitting that we end it by finishing out the century and looking into the aftermath of Nicopolis. While in France and Burgundy, the consequences of the crusade amounted to little more than raising a ransom, mourning some nobles, and celebrating the returning heroes, the Balkans felt the reverberations of Nicopolis for years. When we last left King Sigismund, he was being ferried away from the battle in a Venetian galley towards Constantinople. In Constantinople, he met with the Byzantine emperor and reportedly made plans to launch another crusade, although these plans would be abandoned. In a coincidence of timing, when Sigismund was being ferried out of Constantinople, the prisoners from Nicopolis were in Gallipoli. As the king sailed through the Dardanelles, some of the Ottoman soldiers on the peninsula grabbed a few of the captured prisoners and yelled to the passing galley that Sigismund should land and gather his people. Sigismund wouldn't return to Hungary until early 1397. And while he was away in Constantinople, and then in Venice, and later Dalmatia, Hungary was run by his lieutenants. Sigismund took his time returning to both let the domestic situation in Hungary cool down, and to reaffirm his grasp on the Dalmatian coast. Despite the fact that the failure of the crusade lay with the behavior and decisions of the crusaders themselves much more than on Sigismund, the Hungarian king's reputation suffered greatly in the aftermath of the defeat. 
Upon returning home, the king began a series of reforms to strengthen the Hungarian military and defensive position. He expanded the practice of raising feudal levies to more nobles, and also increased the amount of local militias that could be raised. Furthermore, he began constructing a series of forts along Hungary's southern border, and upgraded the forts that already existed. Sigismund would be imprisoned by his nobles and briefly deposed in 1401. Although it's hard to draw a straight line from Nicopolis to Sigismund's imprisonment, it does show that his reputation in Hungary was still poor despite the changes he made after the battle. However, Sigismund would hold on to power in Hungary, and would even become King of Bohemia and Holy Roman Emperor later in his life. In these ventures, he was aided by the fact that Ottoman attention was diverted from Hungary in the years after Nicopolis. In the wake of the battle, the Ottomans had carte blanche to raid the Balkans. While the Ottoman army could have marched on Buda unopposed, they instead chose to merely raid southern Hungary while they consolidated the area south of the Danube. The Bulgarian territory around Vidin was reoccupied and now directly ruled by the Ottomans, and the Ottoman control over Serbia was strengthened while they also began forays into Bosnia. Even further south, the Ottomans continued their envelopment of the southern Balkans, and Bayezid restarted his siege of Constantinople. However, the Sultan was unable to focus on Europe for long, as not long after the Battle of Nicopolis, some of his Anatolian vassals and allies began to make moves to throw off the Ottoman yoke. Bayezid returned to Asia and made quick work of those with wavering loyalty, and even began to expand further east. But in doing so, the Sultan became the author of his own undoing. Eastern Anatolia was claimed by Timur, also known as Timur the Lame or Tamerlane. Timur claimed to be the successor of the Great Khans, and so considered all the land that was once held by the Ilkhanate to be rightly his. Bayezid, meanwhile, considered himself to be the rightful heir to the Seljuk sultans and refused to submit to Timur, and so the two warrior kings met in the Battle of Ankara in 1402. The Battle of Ankara was a disaster for the Ottomans. Now it was the Ottoman army that was destroyed, and Bayezid was carried off in chains. The next decade or so saw the Ottoman Empire engulfed in chaos and civil conflict. Stefan Lazarevich threw off Ottoman suzerainty and allied himself with Voivod Mircha of Wallachia, and the two briefly were able to push the Ottomans south. Sigismund was unable to do much here, as he was primarily focused on conflicts in Bohemia and the Holy Roman Empire in this period. But eventually, the Ottoman state coalesced under Sultan Mehmed I, and the Ottoman tide began rising again. When the Ottomans renewed their rise under Mehmed and his successors, they were not greeted by further crusades from Western Europe. Eastern European polities continued to fight the Ottomans, sure, but that's because they were right on the Ottoman frontier and had no choice. Nicopolis proved to be one of the last of the Crusades. Western Europe was beginning to form various national identities, and the international nature of the previous crusading movements was a casualty as Christendom split into France and England and others. The flower of Franco-Burgundian chivalry had died on the fields around Nicopolis, and so many nobles began to think twice about going on crusade. Quote, Meanwhile, Dr. Atiyah writes, the demands for money from the bourgeois and clergy, firstly for the crusading preparations, and secondly for the ransom of the prisoners, engendered the spirit of indifference amongst the various classes of medieval society towards what they might justly describe as expensive and futile schemes. The crusading spirit was not dead, and the 15th and 16th centuries saw many smaller expeditions calling themselves crusades launched, and various holy leagues with the aim of combating the Ottomans or heretics form. But the spirit of the age had moved on from crusading. Thank you to Bree from the Pontifex podcast and Ben from the From Wittenberg to Westphalia podcast for reading the quotes for today's episode. Thank you to my patrons, Christine, Comte de Chenonceau, Elliot, Graf von Gravenstein, Anthony, Comte de chateauneuf von auxois and James, Graf von Temsa, and to my Knights of the Duchy. And thank you for listening. If you like this episode, you can support me on patreon.com slash Burgundy. But really, the best way to support the show is by telling people about it and reviewing it on your podcast app of choice. I want as many people as possible to hear about the stories of Valois Burgundy, and spreading the word about this show is the best way to help it grow. If you want to keep up with the show, you can find me on twitter.com at Valois Burgundy. You can also email me at granddukesofthewest at gmail.com, and check out the podcast website for maps, images, sources, and more at granddukesofthewest.com. Once again, thank you so much for listening.